Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. It's Sandy Jones. It's November, and it's time for our lunchtime chat. Today's topic is what to do if your symptoms suddenly get worse. So first of all, I'd just like to remind you, in case you've either forgotten or you haven't checked in with us before for one of our chats, you can send any questions that you have to my CEO, that's Debbie Davis. So that would be at her email address, which is debbie dot Davis, that's D-A-V-I-S, at Parkinson, P-A-R-K-I-N-S-O-N dot C-A. Or you can call me directly on my line here at the office at 416-227-3375. I, of course, won't get your calls um, during this uh, broadcast, uh, but I will when I get back to my desk if you've left me a call that way. Otherwise, please send your uh, email questions to Debbie. She'll let me know what questions you have, and I'll be very happy to try to respond to those questions as we go forward. So again, today's topic is what to do if your symptoms suddenly get worse. When we describe Parkinson's, we refer to it as a chronic progressive, treatable brain disorder that is comprised of problems with both movement, such as stiffness or rigidity, slowness of movement, and tremor, as well as non-movement symptoms, such as depression, anxiety, a variety of sleep disorders, problems with bowels, bladder, low blood pressure, and as Parkinson's advances, for some people, thinking and memory problems do occur, but again, not for everybody. Those issues occur in some individuals as well. So, let's get back to the beginning of that sentence for just a minute. I said it is a chronic condition, meaning it's part of you now. In short, chronic means that it develops over time, may be managed with treatment, but a condition for which there is no cure at this time. Other chronic conditions that you may be familiar with are diabetes, arthritis, for example. The opposite medical term to describe an illness is acute, which is a condition that develops quickly and usually goes away with a combination of treatment and time. In other words, Acute illnesses are usually curable. I think you will agree with me after this explanation that Parkinson's falls under the chronic condition category. So, now let's talk about the term progressive, which can be a scary thought until we put it into context. So here's some good news. For millions of people living with Parkinson's, the progression is very slow and takes years, even decades for some people, to interfere with your quality of life. Many individuals live quite normal lifespans following the diagnosis. So, for the purpose of today's talk, I need to ensure you, that you understand the meaning of slowly progressive, meaning that your symptoms will get worse and become more challenging over time, often over a period of many years, not over a period of months or weeks. So at the risk of being redundant, it's important for you to understand that Parkinson's does not progress rapidly. If there is a major change for the worse in your symptoms over a period of several days or weeks, there is very likely another cause for this, and you need to seek appropriate medical advice. For example, you need to talk to your doctor, either your GP or your neurologist, and make them aware of what has gone on. Unfortunately, many people with Parkinson's, as well as many healthcare professionals, tend to blame everything onto Parkinson's. 
And while Parkinson's may be at the root of the problem, it is important to make your GP or your neurologist aware of this sudden decline, as many acute symptoms need to be treated, or at the very least discussed with your doctors, so that you can have a better understanding of why you are suddenly not able to do the things you were doing a few days ago, or even last week, for example. Remember, Parkinson's does not progress quickly. In previous talks, I have spoken about bladder control and urinary difficulties, such as urinary frequency, that is, frequent trips to the toilet, urinary urgency, that is, a sudden strong urge to urinate immediately, and I talked as well about urinary incontinence, that's the loss of urinary control, where you don't have control over your urination. Also, difficulty starting urination, as well as the sensation of not completely emptying your bladder and also a leakage of urine. Of course, these difficulties are common, even among people who do not have Parkinson's disease, but are certainly well documented in at least one-third of people with Parkinson's. Generally speaking, bladder problems and urinary issues are insidious. That is to say, they have a very gradual onset and slowly sneak up on you over time. There is one urinary problem where there is no sneaking up or creaking up, creeping up involved, however. I'm referring to urinary tract infections or they are commonly referred to in the medical profession as a UTI, again standing for urinary tract infection. I dare say they are the biggest culprit when it comes to causing a sudden worsening of your symptoms. The problem is that urinary tract infections produce symptoms identical to urinary problems due to Parkinson's, such as urgency, and frequency that I mentioned a minute or two ago. So you may have difficulty convincing your doctor that he or she needs to rule out a UTI as the cause of your declining symptoms. Here are a couple of tips that may be helpful when it comes to identifying urinary tract infections. Do you have any burning or pain when you pass urine? Are you passing your urine more urgently or even more often than is usual for you? Do you have a fever? Some older patients with Parkinson's may also experience confusion, hallucinations, or delusions as the only feature of a urinary tract infection. So it is important to consider and to exclude this as a possible explanation when the patient's mental health suddenly changes for no apparent reason. So if you are experiencing any of the, the above, see your family doctor and request to have a urine culture done as a simple urine analysis can detect an infection or in, and infections are easy to treat with antibiotics. If you have not experienced any of the above, then just tuck away this information in a file marked, what to do if my symptoms suddenly get worse, for your future reference. While we're on the topic of infections, another type of infection that is common in Parkinson's patients are respiratory infections, and in particular, pneumonia, the most common type being aspiration pneumonia which is related to ineffective swallowing when food, liquid, and saliva get into the lungs. So things to watch out for here are, do you have a cold, a cough, or a fever? Understanding that all infections cause sudden worsening of your symptoms, you should see your family doctor if your cold, cough, 
or fever persist. Or if you have colored sputum when you cough, especially if you have difficulty breathing, by all means, you definitely see, need to see your general practitioner as antibiotics will be necessary to treat infections of this type as well. Now, just to complicate things more, here is the scoop on antibiotics. I've just told you that infections often cause your symptoms to suddenly get worse and that you will require antibiotics to get rid of the infection. But guess what? Antibiotics interfere with the way your Parkinson's medications work. So, while you are taking antibiotics, which you must do to combat the infection or it will just continually get worse and worse, your Parkinson's symptoms will not respond as well as they usually do to your medications, i.e., you will spend more time feeling off than on. And if that's not bad enough, it can take two to three weeks after antibiotics are completed for them to wash out of your system. So you won't feel like your normal self for several weeks during and after your antibiotic treatment. First, the infection makes symptoms worse. And then, antibiotics needed to treat the infection keep you feeling poorly for several weeks afterwards and after they have been prescribed. If the first cause of an antibiotic is not, of course I should say, of an antibiotic is not successful, and sometimes it can take a couple of them to get to the root um, of the uh, virus and or bacteria that's going on. And if your symptoms persist after you've taken the full course of the antibiotic, you need to repeat those tests those cultures, be it a ureter, if you had a, a urinary tract infection, or a sputum test uh, may be needed, uh, and then another antibiotic may need to be tried after that. Well, I now have some good news. These setbacks are temporary. Too long for your liking, no doubt, but temporary all the same. So once again, Parkinson's does not progress rapidly, and you will feel gradually better and back to normal. But don't get discouraged, because it could take several weeks. Dehydration, or lack of adequate fluids, can cause havoc in our bodies from the time we are born right up until the elderly as it upsets the balance of our essential chemicals, in particular, something called our electrolytes, which are chemicals within our bodies. And if our electrolytes get out of balance, they cause behaviors that we would not normally see. This was a lesson I learned as a nursing student many years ago more years ago than I would like to admit, to be honest. Elderly folks would be brought, usually by ambulance, into the emergency department. And they would be what we referred to at the time as away with the fairies. They would be very confused, usually hallucinating, i.e. seeing things or people that weren't there. Or they would be delusional, they would be believing they would tell us that someone was trying to kill them, for example, or that their family was taking all their money, or that their spouse was having an affair. Naturally, they were very agitated, and even folks who were tiny and frail used to be as strong as an ox, particularly if they perceived us, their healthcare professionals, as a threat as well. The first thing we were supposed to do was take a blood sample and do a urine test to send off to the lab for analysis to look for a possible infection. Well, I wish you luck trying to draw blood or getting a urine sample from someone who's flailing around on a stretcher. 
Good luck with that. So the second course of action was to start an intravenous. Also, often, easier said than done. And we would start an IV drip which of normal saline, which again is a, is a natural substance within our bodies. So the purpose of all of this was to correct any chemical imbalance within the patient. Before we knew it, the patient would be calm, perfectly lucid, and able to carry on a normal, rational conversation. It was like we were seeing a completely different individual. It never failed that during the taking of the patient's history, we confirmed that sure enough, they had recently cut down on their fluid intake for a variety of reasons. Usually because they didn't want to have to make so, trips, so many trips to the bathroom, particularly during the night. And the end result was the scenario I have just described. They weren't demented. We, back in the day, we used to call this senile or pre-senile dementia. There was nothing wrong with them, except for the fact that yeah, no. their electrolytes were out of whack. And that what was going, what was, what was going on and was corrected quite easily with an intravenous solution of normal saline. I have mentioned in previous chats with you how, as human beings, we are finely tuned machines and are very precisely put together on many levels. Most of the time, we can take this balance for granted because, generally speaking, we behave in pretty much the same way on a regular basis. However, the maintenance of a relatively stable state of equilibrium can be quite easily put out of whack, even with something as simple as cutting down on the amount of fluid we drink on a daily basis. Just in case any of you are thinking, oh good, Sandy says I should increase the amount I drink and think that I'm referring to alcohol. Well, if you thought that, give your heads a shake. The fluids I'm talking about are water and juice, fluids like that. In fact, in case you didn't know, Alcohol, coffee, and tea are, in fact, very dehydrating. They actually, instead of, you may think that drinking them increases your fluid balance in your body, they actually take the fluids out of your body. So they take water out of your system, and they have exactly the opposite effect on your body than you are trying to achieve by drinking them. So. I'm not saying you can't drink alcohol, tea, and coffee, etc., as long as you understand their dehydrating effect on your system and don't count them as part of your fluid intake each day. You must compensate by drinking at least six to eight glasses of water every day so that your system will stay well hydrated. I know by now that some, and maybe even many of you, are thinking, so what the heck does all this have to do with Parkinson's? Lots. People with Parkinson's are often tempted to cut down on their fluid intake in the hope of reducing the number of trips they have to make to the bathroom or to try to ensure that they don't have an embarrassing accident when they are out in public. So, given your issues with slowness of movement and increased stiffness, particularly during the times when your medications are not working as well and you are off and your medications are at a low level in your systems, added to that an increase in the number of times you need to go to the bathroom on a daily basis as well as you need to go immediately, if not sooner, once you get the urge to go, because of all of that, I have no problem why you, under, why you think a good coping strategy might be to decrease your fluids. It makes sense on one level, but unfortunately, it's not what I call good sense. 
And if all this isn't complicated enough, I have another symptom that causes dehydration, just to add it to the mix. One third of people living with Parkinson's have one of the non-motor symptoms known as excessive sweating. Most of us associate excessive sweating with heat and activity or increased exercise. People with Parkinson's, however, may find themselves sweating with no exercise or even just with mild exercise. Why this happens, like so many other things with Parkinson's, is not really known. Excessive sweating commonly occurs when your muscles are stiff, in other words, during your off periods. It also occurs if you have dyskinesia, which are the excessive movements that occur as a side effect of your medications. So the kind of sweating that I'm talking about when I refer to excessive sweating is the kind where you're actually soaked to the skin on a regular basis. Similar to the amount of sweating that happens to many women during menopause. If this symptom, if you have this symptom, then it's important to drink, drink, drink. Water, preferably. Of, of course, avoiding very hot and humid environments setting your own house thermostat a little bit lower, wearing lighter clothing, avoiding strenuous activity in heat can also help, but staying hydrated is mandatory. So a lot of us don't necessarily associate sweating, or in this case, excessive sweating, with the need to drink, drink, drink. But what goes out has to come in. I mentioned that excessive sweating sometimes occurs when your medications are wearing off or when you have dyskinesia, so it's important to monitor when the sweating is taking place. This is important information for your doctor and may result in medication changes, particularly with the timing of, of your pills. Ah, are we having fun yet? I know having Parkinson's is tough enough without having to think about the fact that your symptoms can suddenly get worse. But remember, the purpose of these chats is not to scare you and worry you more than you already are. I'm just trying to share some information with you to put in your resource toolkit so that you have an idea of what to do if things change for what might appear to you to be for no apparent reason. Okay, so onward and upward. I'm going to talk now about your least favorite symptom. Guess what that might be? It starts with a C. Yep, I'm referring to constipation. I have talked about constipation several times over the past few months, so I'm not going to belabor the point today, except to point out that severe constipation, and that's usually as defined as less than three bowel movements per week, can interfere with the way your medications are absorbed and therefore increase your symptoms because your medications are not able to act as efficiently and effectively as they normally do which, in turn, will naturally make your symptoms worse and often make them suddenly worse. Don't forget, please, that we do have a resource sheet called a Bowel Management Program for People with Parkinson's. It is available. All you need to do is call or ask us via email. Some people with Parkinson's experience sudden and severe worsening of symptoms if there are any changes in their medications, including new medications, also changes in dose of medications, and also discontinuation of medications. So basically, any change in your Parkinson's medication regime can, experience, can cause you to experience sudden and severe worsening of your symptoms. 
Earlier in my talk today, I emphasized the fact that Parkinson's is a slowly progressive disease and that the rate of progression is different for everyone. Until we have a medication that will slow down or at best stop the progression, however, it stands to reason that medications that are effective at one stage of the disorder won't be sufficient later on. So, over time, you can expect to have increases to your current dosage or changes in the frequency with which you take the medication, i.e., you will at some point have to take more medication and at shorter intervals as well. Increases such as these may bring side effects which you have not yet experienced before, such as dyskinesias, those involuntary movements, or wearing off, which means that your medication is not lasting well in your system until the next dose, so you are worn off by the time you take the next medication, and of course, your symptoms are worse again. Another important fact to take into account is that individuals' dopamine symptoms gradually become sensitized to levodopa or to other anti-Parkinson's medications, and side effects may appear even at the dosage a person has taken for years. I think that sentence is worth repeating. I'm going to repeat it now. Another important fact to take into account is that individuals' dopamine systems gradually become sensitized to levodopa. In other words, you build up a tolerance to the levodopa. This can happen as well with other anti-Parkinson's medications. And therefore, side effects may appear even at the dosage a person has taken for years. This is something that we quite frequently get calls about as well. People will say, you know, I've been taking the same levodopa medication now for five years, and suddenly I find that there are changes and that I'm wearing off or that I now have dyskinesias, etc. And that's not easy to understand. So that's why I'm repeating those, uh, those words to you right now. Side effects can also appear because of the combined effects of medications, or after surgery, or if the individual, again, has an infection, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. So side effects can appear for all kinds of reasons. Even something that seems as simple like the addition of a sleeping pill, can totally upset the apple cart in a negative way and cause symptoms for some individuals to become worse quite suddenly. The bottom line is that if you experience any sudden changes in your ability to function or untoward side effects that are interfering with your quality of life, be sure to report these things to your physician, as your medications can be adjusted and doctors can't treat what they don't know about. Remember, doctors are not psychic and they don't have crystal balls, so they are using their education, their experience, and their best judgment to determine what the best treatment regime is for each and every one of you. Later on in the course of the disease, symptoms do become more difficult to treat, and there is often a very fine line and small difference between the medication regimen that enables a person to function and a regimen that triggers unacceptable side effects or even makes the symptoms, even the individual's symptoms worse. In other words, the line between function and disability can be quite thin and unfortunately sometimes the old adage and familiar saying of trial and error enters into this equation before things can get back on track again. 
any type of illness, in particular, any hospitalization can really throw a wrench in the works and cause your symptoms to suddenly worsen. Again, this is another reason why your symptoms can suddenly get worse. The reasons for a hospitalization or any type of illness causing your symptoms to suddenly worsen are, to say the least, numerous and multifaceted. But here are a few of the main culprits in this scenario. Any illness, such as the flu, influenza, any viral or bacterial disease that is marked by a respiratory or intestinal symptoms resulting in the destruction of your regular medication regime, including problems even keeping your pills down due to vomiting, will cause sudden worsening of your symptoms. They will also cause the need for extra sleep, so, you're, so you sleep through your pill, time, pill times, etc. And when it comes to requiring hospitalization, well, as many of you have already experienced, that's a horse of another color altogether. As I've talked about before, the most common reasons people with Parkinson's who must be hospitalized, including needing elective surgery for things like gallbladder removal, the treatment of things like kidney problems, any heart issues, falls that result in fractures, infections, changes in alertness such as extreme sleepiness, confusion, hallucinations, as well as aspiration pneumonia. These are all often reasons why people with Parkinson's require hospitalization. As I've also mentioned before in previous talks, generally speaking, hospitals are, for the most part, ineffective when it comes to caring for the specific needs of people with Parkinson's due to the lack of education and understanding that the healthcare professionals within those institutions have about Parkinson's. If you recall, I did explain this to you in a previous chat, and as long as you understand that the staff really do want to help you recover from whatever took you through their doors in the first place, their lack of understanding of both Parkinson's often is the root cause for your symptoms to worsen while you were there. Again, I know I've mentioned all of these things before, but I do think they're worth repeating. The most common problem when you're in hospital involves your medication schedule. Staff are accustomed to administering medications at 9 a.m., 1 p.m., 5 p.m., and 9 p.m. if you're taking medications four times a day, or 8 a.m., 2 p.m., 6 p.m., and 10 p.m. And I have no doubt that your medication schedule doesn't even resemble these times when you're living in your own home in the community. We know from experience that given the pressures on staff, a complicated schedule of oral medications is simply not going to be followed with great accuracy. Having spoken on this topic, I don't want to go into any further detail about it today. Suffice to say that if you encounter this problem, please give us a call and we will provide you with some education resources for healthcare professionals that might help. But the minute you or anybody else changes the frequency with which you take your medication, including the timing of your medication, you can expect automatically that your symptoms are going to suddenly get worse. Another need to know on this topic is that a Parkinson's patient may be given drugs that conflict with your anti-Parkinson medications. So it's important for both you, the patient, as well as your family members to monitor what medications are being administered because being given the wrong medication as a person with Parkinson's, again, it will make your Parkinson's symptoms worse very quickly. 
regardless of what illness you have and regardless of whether or not you have required hospitalization, it can take several weeks for your symptoms to return to baseline and for you to feel like your old self again. Have you experienced any major stressors lately, such as a move to a new home, a death in the family, anything of that major proportion, etc.? There is a direct correlation between stress and the exacerbation of symptoms. So if you are in a stressful situation, your symptoms will suddenly get worse until the stress passes. It's important to understand, while stress can temporarily aggravate symptoms of Parkinson's, it does not affect the underlying slow progression of the disease. So being stressed will not cause you to have ongoing symptoms of worsening. In other words, if someone is very anxious, under pressure, angry, or excited, the motor symptoms such as tremor, slowness of movement, and gait problems may get suddenly worse, but the actual disease is not getting worse. The symptoms are temporarily getting worse. When the stress passes, your tremor, your slowness of movement, and your walking problems will return to your baseline level. Please note that I've talked just now about stress and excitement in the same sentence. Stress can actually be both good stress and bad stress, i.e. the symptoms of Parkinson's can be aggravated by negative stress, such as being put under pressure at work, or positive stress, such as the excitement of watching the Blue Jays or the Raptors as they win games quite consistently these days. Notice I didn't mention anything about the Toronto Maple Leafs. I wonder why. Although they are a good example of negative stress with the way they're playing at the moment, I'm afraid. If possible, try to identify what helps you to relax. Things like exercise, listening to music, meditation, etc. So take heart. The suddening worsening of your symptoms is again temporary and not permanently damaging. This may seem obvious, but I feel I should mention that if you have fallen, fallen especially and hit your head recently, have experienced a headache or a sudden change in your symptoms afterwards, you could have a concussion or even internal bleeding which can occur with head injury and could result in the worsening of your symptoms. Any type of head injury should be taken seriously, even if you don't think it was all that bad at the time. You never know how much damage you could have done. And it is important to see your family doctor for advice regarding the next steps. The last topic I'm going to talk about today is your sleep pattern. Has there been a major change in your sleep pattern recently? Poor sleep can make all of us feel as though we're not functioning as high, at high a level as we could at times. And definitely, poor sleep can make all your Parkinson's symptoms worse. There are numerous problems related to sleep. In fact, I t intend to do a complete lunchtime chat on sleep next year in the new year. But I'm going to mention a few of the problems that can interrupt your sleep, just to give you a few reasons why some people with Parkinson's have poor sleep. One is day and night reversal. Some people with Parkinson's sleep all day and therefore they're awake all night. There's also excessive daytime sleepiness where people with Parkinson's sleep throughout the day. The reality is 
we only require just so much sleep per day. And if you're sleeping for two or three hours during the day, you won't expect to be able to go to sleep and stay asleep all night. And by that I mean get eight hours of sleep at night on top of all of that. Depression can also be a reason for not sleeping. People who are severely and profoundly depressed, sometimes as a result of it being a non-motor symptom of Parkinson's, can also have issues with uh, major problems relating to sleep. Another problem is called sleep fragmentation. That's where you can get to sleep, but you waken, takes you a long, long time to get back to sleep again, and therefore you're not getting a restful full night's sleep. REM sleep behavior disorder, that's rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder, can also be very disruptive to sleep. Urinary frequency. Seems to me we were just talking about that. If you have to get up several times during the night, you're not getting a restful and replenished sleep. Vivid dreams are another reason why people with Parkinson's have difficulty getting enough sleep. Increased motor symptoms during the night, such as increased difficulty uh, with stiffness making it difficult to roll over uh, in bed and therefore that wakens you. You talk to your doctor if you're having these issues because, as I said, poor sleep can have a negative impact on your quality of life and will definitely make all your symptoms worse. I'm going to read a little bit of a document that was put together by a, a movement disorder specialist, a Parkinson specialist, not too long ago, and I feel that a lot of the points that she makes in this article are very important with respect to sleep. She says, sleep is an essential part of life that most of us take for granted. Until Parkinson's disease affected us, or our partner that is, even prior to the onset of the motor symptoms, sleep disturbance can occur. This includes disrupted sleep, frequently waking and being unable to turn in, in bed, or even excessive sleep. Sleepiness can interfere with daytime activities even before medications are started. Once treatment begins, sleepiness during the day can increase. Medications can also make falling asleep difficult. Medications such as amantadine, selegiline, and even levodopa or some of the dopamine agonists cause us to have difficulty falling asleep. And even if you get to sleep, you may shout or thrash in your sleep or find yourself waking up strangling your, sp your spouse, unintentionally of course, but that comes under the umbrella of rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder. So there are countless ways the Parkinson's disease intrudes even upon your nighttime life as well as your daytime life. As I said, I intend to do a full lunchtime chat in the new year on sleep, and I will go through many of these symptoms again. But again, I just want you to, to ensure that sleep is indeed, it is essential, it is a naturally recurring condition when your eyes are closed and your muscles are relaxed. But again, it's a great mystery and remains, but it, at the same time, it remains one of the cornerstones of good health. Sleeping well is essential to your physical and emotional well-being. And as I said, it is a huge culprit when it comes to making your Parkinson's symptoms worse. If you have a bad night, a sleepless night, or even a night where you're awake and asleep throughout the night and you don't get a replenished sleep and a restful sleep, you can fully expect that your symptoms will definitely be worse 
for the next day and maybe even for two or three days after that. So it is really important that you speak to your doctor. So in summary for today's talk, if, as you can see, if you experience a sudden decline, if there is a major change in your symptoms over several days or week, there is an underlying cause for this rapid deterioration. Again, because Parkinson's does not progress rapidly and suddenly get worse. The things I've discussed today are not necessarily all-inclusive. There may be other things going on as well, but hopefully this will at least give you a start in uncovering why you are doing, were doing quite well and now suddenly you are not functioning well at all. You will get back to baseline as, these, as you get treatment for whatever these symptoms um, uh, are being caused by. For example, once the infections are being treated, etc., or if you have to treat your infection, then once your antibiotic uh, gets stopped, you will get back to baseline. But it will still take some time. So try not to get too discouraged while you're putting this puzzle together. So I don't think any questions have come in today. Um, thanks for listening. I'm glad, I'm glad you were on the line today with this. If you have further questions about this, you know how to reach us. Again, my number, 416-227-3375. I'm really delighted to hear the number of folks that are on the line on a regular basis during these chats. It's encouraging to me and also for the number of you who tune in later when the second Tuesday of the month is not convenient for you. So take care everybody. Um, December's talk is going to be called De Debunking the Myths about Parkinson's. That's Debunking the Myths about Parkinson's. There are many tr things that people believe out there that are related to uh, Parkinson's which are simply not true. So I'm going to name at least some of those. If you, for yourself, have come across a myth that you realize that maybe I should include in this talk, I'd be more than happy to put that into my talk. So please let me know. And also, again, please do contact me if there is a particular subject that you want to hear about uh, on any given month because, again, these talks are for you, not me. So let me know what helps and what doesn't. Thanks so much. See you in December. Take care, and bye for now. The leader has turned lecture off, and your lines have been unmuted. What about uh, decaffeinating?